Tom. Right now, we welcome in Teo Armis, who covers Northern Virginia locally for the Washington Post on this uh, latest. I feel I feel like I was in the headline writing business, Teo. We, we just go monumental disaster. That feels like it's, it's low-hanging fruit here, yeah? <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, I'll let you write that headline. Uh, I don't know if we can uh, make make quite that uh, uh, pointed a statement. But, you know, things are definitely looking grim uh, for this arena plan in, in Richmond. Especially yeah, it's, after today. it's it's not good. Uh, maybe disaster is too strong. Well, so let, let me get your I mean, your your take on this is not really the right uh, phrasing here. Let me get your uh, where, where you think we are, your state of play here as someone who's reporting on this. Like what what happened here to get us to this point? Why is it so surprising? And where does that leave us? And then we can jump off the where does that leave us and go from there? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, for this to happen, for the Caps and Wizards to move to Alexandria, uh, the plan was always going to need approval and sign off from the Virginia General Assembly. And um, they meet for 60 days. It's a pretty rushed 60 days between January and March. Um, and there were always really going to be sort of three ways to get it through the General Assembly. There could have been a bill starting in the House, a bill starting in the Senate, or it could have been folded into the state budget. Um, there's this one uh, senator who listeners might be familiar with now uh, based off of her uh, social media feed, Louise Lucas, um, who runs the Finance Committee in the Senate. Um, and basically, um, you know, she stopped the Senate bill from taking off. Um, the House passed the bill, then it has to cross over into the Senate. She stopped that from happening, too. Um, and as of today, it seems like she has stopped uh, the arena from ending up in the state budget as well. So basically, she's blocked all three of those avenues. Um, and there are a couple of weird things that Governor Youngkin can potentially try and do. Um, but it seems unlikely that uh, he will try to do those things. So one of those things from my understanding, Teo, is that he can basically now call like a committee on this of some kind or debate on this of some kind. Uh, and you can you can make me right here, hopefully, uh, but that it's a standalone. Like a lot of times things get done when they get put in these gigantic budgets where there's a million things and there's there's handshake here. You give me this. I give you that. OK, we both get what we want, even though we said we'd never give the other person the other thing. But now we can go back to our district and be like, see, look what we did. And, and thus things never get done in politics, uh, especially at the federal and state levels, single handedly, like as single issue type of, of votes and debates. That is kind of now where we're at, though, with Glenn Youngkin, right? Like if, if he's going to do this, it's going to have to be about the stadium and not included in some larger thing unless he waits a full year. Most likely, yeah. I, I mean, I think a lot of people definitely expected an arena or, you know, or, or maybe some people, I should say, expected an arena to come out of the budget deal because it was, you know, the the space for that bartering. This is basically something that's happening behind closed doors. It's a dozen lawmakers. And, you know, I mean, Democrats have a lot of things they want uh, to, to get the OK from Yunkin on, whether that's, you know, a recreational market for marijuana or, you know, toll relief in, in the Hampton Roads area that was kind of going to be where all the bartering is. And, and you're, you're right there, right? That like, I think the avenues that are left are basically things that would require a little bit more of a standalone. And I mean, regardless of what those things are, um, he said at a press conference in Richmond today that, you know, he's basically going to sort of stand down at this point. He's not really going to pursue any of the options that are left. Why do you think that he's doing that? Like, was it the blowback? Was it, I mean, what did, what did he, why do you think and what did he say about why he went from having a press conference with Ted Leonsis to being like, yeah, I don't think I really want to fight for this. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a good question. You know, the general assembly session is not over. Uh, it ends on Saturday. So, you know, I think we're going to kind of have to read the tea leaves here a little bit, but he could certainly be, sort of playing a political move the same way that some Democrats could be playing a political move. And, you know, tomorrow or, or the day after they do a 180 and say, actually, we've changed our minds on this. Uh, at, you know, the, the press conference he had, he basically indicated that he's going to be vetoing a whole bunch of, uh, you know, Democratic bills, Democratic priorities. And, and so maybe that threat is, you know, what he needs to get the arena through. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to say, and we're going to have to be watching, you know, pretty closely over the next like 48 hours or so to, um, you know, really really see where this goes and and see what you know he ultimately ends up doing. Teo Armis, Northern Virginia reporter, 
for the Washington Post with us talking about uh, the the uh, the Glen Dome, as it's been called, being shot down uh, in Richmond in the General Assembly. So there was also a report, I think, from WT or no, I think it was from WAMU uh, that Leonsis had never met with Luis Lucas until like yesterday. What role does Ted and Monumental play in the, the state of play right now? Yeah, I mean, um, Ted and Monumental are kind of, I would say, one of the four big parties to the deal. Uh, and, and as such, I think they've been lobbying pretty hard in Richmond to try and get this through the General Assembly. But this is, you know, this is Youngkin's turf. This is Youngkin's court. And so I think Monumental, you know, has, has kind of been working hand in hand with the governor's administration, you know, to basically just convince state lawmakers, including, you know, Senator Louise Lucas, that, um, this is the right thing for Virginia, uh, you know, and, and the right thing for Alexandria and, and sort of the right thing for the state. Obviously, they have uh, struggled to do that um, at, at this point. Um, but I think a lot of the framing has been on Youngkin specifically because it's, you know, it's his venue, so to speak. Right. You know, the same way that I think if this ultimately does get to Alexandria, which is the next body that would need to vote on all this, I think the focus is, is going to shift away from uh, someone like Yunkin and probably more so to the mayor of Alexandria. Um, but we'll see if we even, even get to that point. Right. It's not like if they can pull a Hail Mary here that it, that it, they're actually now in the clear because a lot of the local opposition. And, you know, I think on the, the monumental side, too, which is obviously uh, very much in focus for our audience on, on a sports show. Um, yeah. Like there is there's convincing legislatures, there's convincing mayors, convincing those. But there's also convincing the public. What have you made of mm-hmm. Monumental's PR campaign? Uh, because th- that has been, I mean, obviously there's been some things that they pulled back. There's been uh, some aggressive like posting and, and email sending and all of these things to make sure that their message, quote unquote, is getting out. Like, what have you made a, of that? And, and, you know, as someone who covers these kinds of things, have you ever seen something quite like it? Yes and no. You know, I, I think it's it's been really interesting because, I mean, there are political campaigns around these sorts of things all the time, right? You know, there was an effort at one point to, like, put a casino in Fairfax County, and I think you already sort of started to see um, some of the, you know, energy from, from people who wanted it, from people who didn't want it. Um, but, uh, you know, I think what's really interesting on the monumental side is, like, they own a TV network, right? So they have been, you know, running all these ads while you know, folks are trying to watch Caps games or, or Wizards games, you know, basically putting Ted or, or exactly Leontis or other folks from Monumental front and center and saying, you know, this is uh, this is why why this is a good deal. But it's, I mean, Alexandria is a, a tricky place to do this in a lot of ways because I think the public there is like so politically savvy and, you know, so hyper engaged and people really care about what happens in their backyard and they know politics. Um, so it is, you know, a thing that, I mean, maybe somewhere else it, it would have flown uh, without quite as much criticism, but but I think they're sort of really having to go toe-to-toe with a lot of, um, like, neighborhood activists here. Yeah, and it also feels like the kind of thing where if you're explaining, you're losing, and they have been doing endless explaining. Are, are you surprised at how, like, when Leonsis came out, I think it was with the interview with WUSA 9, where he's like, I'm surprised at the blowback. Are you surprised that they're surprised? Oof. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think I'm surprised at the blowback, right? Like, I, I write about Alexandria. That's my job. And, you know, people there get so intense and passionate about, like, the color of the wall on a new development or something. But, you know, I, I mean, a lot of this was kind of negotiated in secret, right? It was negotiated behind closed doors and... um so to some degree, I guess it would have been impossible to know what, uh, you know, the reaction would have been like from from the community, you know, without going out and, and being public. But um, what a concept, Teo, you know, but but but, you know, I mean, it's it's tricky, right? The way that this economic development stuff works in Virginia is, is really tricky, you know, but but on the other hand, right, like I said, Alexandria, you know, these, these neighborhoods in particular, right, Old Town and, and Delray and Potomac Yard. Um, they they care about what happens in their backyard, and not that other people don't, but they they care and they know how to get involved, and you know they will show up and and make their voices heard. I think that uh, I think I think the people that you write about, Teo, would love the first segment of my show today. 
because that was that was that was kind of the message that if you care, you can get stuff done. And and here we are. Uh, and and this is what happens uh, in a society where people don't care uh, often is things get negotiated in secret. And now all of a sudden you run up against people who do care. And it's like, whoa, they care, um, which leads us to let's say let's say Virginia and Teo Armis, uh, Northern Virginia reporter uh, for The Washington Post, is our guest here on The Hoffman Show. Let's say Youngkin does pull this out. That he, the threat of, hey, well, you're not going to give me this. You're not going to get any things that you want. I'm going to veto all of them works. And Senator Lucas is like, you want to know what? Uh, I've talked to enough people. I actually don't think this is the worst thing to at least let it get to a debate. Like, well, I'll let Mm -hmm. it get to this next step. And then it gets to Alexandria. What kind of roadblocks exist locally from the politics to the logistics of what needs to happen to make this thing feasible? Yeah, um, I think there are really two good questions uh, here, the first of which is related to labor and labor unions. Um, you know, a lot of the Alexander City Council is a lot smaller than the Virginia General Assembly. We're talking about seven people instead of 140. Um, so it's easier to convince convince those seven people. But a lot of those seven have said that if organized labor is not on board. Um, with the project, they're not going to be on board either. Um, and as of right now, as of a couple of weeks ago, uh, the hospitality unions and then the construction unions, you know, have come out and basically said this deal is a bad deal for for Virginia workers, for, you know, the D.C. region's workers. And and so I think having to sit back down with labor and and hash something out that, you know, works for all parties is definitely going to be a top priority um, as far as convincing, you know, those those lawmakers. I think the other big thing is uh, there is an election happening in Alexandria. The mayor isn't running for re-election. Um, every seat on city council is is up for election, and um, I think things uh, if if it does get to that point, you know things are going to get really heated really quickly. Um, everyone has said that you know they would expect a vote um, by the end of this year, so you know while the current city council is is still in place, um, but you know from the very beginning, a lot of folks in Alexandria have been pushing for a referendum, and I think it uh, would be very possible for that city council election to basically kind of turn into a Sort of a de facto um, referendum of sorts on on the arena project, just as you know, there's so many opinions on this and and so many emotions around this as well. Uh, that's actually a great place to end. Uh, so la- last question for you, Teo. I was reading uh, the story last night that you guys had in the post, and one line that caught my eye was that. Virgin- there are some Virginia legislators who basically think it's wrong to pull these teams out of D.C., that the blowback, not just locally in Alexandria, but the blowback from the region and specifically in the district and how things went down here with Bowser and, um, you know, feel like, again, felt like very middle of the night, like secretive, and, and you're kind of pulling the city game out of the city. All of those things get into, into one giant bucket, but it leads to some concern for some Virginia legislature or legislators. How wide is that concern and is that a type of thing that that could be overcome if they just kind of think this is this is all wrong to begin with? Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. Um, it's not something we've heard from every single state lawmaker uh, by any means, but I think it's definitely something we've heard from at least a handful. I mean, you know, Arlington, Alexandria, Fairfax, it's it's not a different country, right? I mean. Um, the D.C. region is, is really well integrated and folks are crossing the river all the time and, you know, working in D.C. and, and living in Northern Virginia or vice versa. And, and so I think, you know, some lawmakers do ultimately feel a little bit responsible for what happens to the district because their constituents are people who come into the district all the time. Um, as to how widespread that is, I, I, you know, Virginia is a big state. There's a lot of people who are in Richmond and are not from Northern Virginia. And and I think that's where things start to get a little bit more complicated, but it's not something you can count out by any means. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. And um, I'm glad someone's responsible for the district because we don't have anybody representing us, but that's a whole different radio show. Uh, Teo Armas (laughs) uh, with us here on the Hoffman show. Teo, great insight as always. Uh, I'm sure, you know, shoot, depending on what happens in the next 48 hours, maybe we'll talk to you very, very soon. But I'm sure as more developments come in, we'll have you back on the show. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Thank you so much for having me. You got it. That's Teo Armas, everybody. Hey, this is DA, and you're listening to The Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.